Well, hello, and welcome to the second day of b &H Photos Food Week. Uh, for all of you that saw yesterday's presentations, they were absolutely fabulous. Uh, I don't think I've ever made any product that looks as beautiful as the things I saw yesterday, but I can only imagine that I will do better after all of these times. Uh, and speaking of beautiful dishes, we are here today with Maria Perez. She is of b &H's a social team and an outstanding cinematographer, photographer, and from the cooking in the time of quarantine, looks like an amazing cook as well. How are you doing today, Maria? Good. That was a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the uh, distinct pleasure to travel with Maria before and, and seen her work, and you are nothing if not a dynamo and a ton of fun to be around, so I can only imagine um, with the cookbook, this was something that was driven prior to the pandemic, uh, or was this something that you and Sam really just came up with by being forced to be in lockdown? Well, um, so this is the cookbook for everybody to see. Um, it's about 50 pages. And so I've, we've always been into cooking. My family is from South America. We're all into, you know, very culture cuisine. And uh, my fiance, he's Israeli and also very different type of cuisine. And we're all like, we love home cooked food. And uh, I've always wanted to have s at least like a binder of everything put together. And cause mm -hmm. like, I'm more of a type A and Sam's a little type B where he has like pieces of paper everywhere. So I thought over the quarantine, we should really condense everything. And I was like, why not make this a project? Because, you know, we're stuck inside and bored. And uh, I decided to take uh, cook everything and take photos, put the recipes together. And then as, you know, time went, I felt like, you know, this would be a great opportunity to do some good in the world. So, uh, I decided why not also sell this book and use some of the and use all the proceeds to charity and um, so that's exactly what we did. So I we I designed the cookbook, I had it published, I printed it, I got it printed, and then um, sold it. We sold like like a hundred of them, and um, yeah, and we did all the proceeds for COVID relief, and then did like a second round and did different charities, charities of your choice, and yeah, so it's been so cool, and then like it's kind of crazy. It's already been over a year, and uh, yeah, that's amazing. And I was lucky enough uh, to get the digital okay. copy of your cookbook. Thank you, Maria. Uh, and I cooked two recipes prior to this, so I could speak to something cool. that you did. And I cooked the uh, the egg in the hole. Uh huh as well as the uh, sweet potato hash. So I yeah. got two, two recipes in <laughs> and that's where we are now. So uh, mine again, did not turn out quite as beautifully as your images, um, but nonetheless, they were, they tasted fantastic. That's great. The, the sweet potato hash was something I would never have contemplated cooking prior to reading your book. Uh, and it was absolutely an amazing uh, protein and something to go along with the yeah, eggs. So. That's like a perfect one for like a, a big group too. Oh, okay. Yeah. You could just well, that, do a ton of sweet potatoes. <laughs> that, that's the problem I have is that there are three of us in my house and I cook as though there are 20. So we always end up having way too much yeah. left over. So that's something I probably should speak to you about a little bit more to uh, figure out size differentials. Uh, you know, you said it yield six people. I, we, the three of us went through the entire thing. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fantastic. I don't know. Did you have a presentation that you wanted to do today or maybe uh, go through the book? Um, yeah, we could go through the book. Okay. I think that would be great. Uh, now I have a uh, digital copy of it. If Perfect. you wanted me to do a screen share. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Give me one second. Let me pull this up. You would think after how long have we been in <laughs> Zoom life? I'd have this. There we go. So here's the <clears throat> recipe that I was speaking of. And one of the things that I love so much, I'm going to go back up to here, is how well you documented everything that you cooked. I mean, this is some really beautiful techniques that you have. Um, how did you shoot this image right here? Um, so all the images are shot on a uh, Sony a7R 4 um, depending on some of the shots, um, but for the most part, they're on a 24 to 70, but some of the ones that needed to be wider, I used a 16 to 35. Gotcha. Um, and then I was, I have, um, so you can kind of see where the light's coming from. I have a window to the side of my dining room table. That's my dining room table. Luckily it's like a nice piece of wood. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
So yeah. And I always made sure to use like morning light to make sure like I got the best light anytime. Like when I was shooting all these, I was kind of like freaking out. Like I did have to have myself kind of like on a schedule of when I cook these, because after a certain time, the sun's no longer there. And then I'm like, Oh no, like kind of freaking out. Like the, the soup one, the, um, butternut squash soup. I think I used flash for that one. Cause it's also like soup. I wasn't going to make that in the middle of the day. It was more for dinner. So, uh, I ended up using flash for that one. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved so much about everything that you have here is that it, they're extremely simple recipes, mm -hmm. but they have a, a really amazing complexity to them. Like I said, I, I never would have thought to have done the hash in the sweet potato before. Yeah. Um, and that's so, like a one skillet thing. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. Now, are these family recipes or are these, here's the butternut squash. Yeah. Speaking of. See, you can kind of tell like there's like a little bit of flash on that one because it was yeah. nighttime and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you did a pretty good job. You could tell there's a flash on there, but you did a pretty good job of uh, creating a similar mm -hmm. uh, lighting to it. So I liked it. Uh, now, are these family recipes? Are these things that you and Sam just came up with together or you kind of riffed off of things that you. It's a little bit before? of both. Um, like some of them are some that I've seen that I've like kind of made it more of my own of things that I've took out or put in. Uh, some of them are family recipes, like the matzo ball soup is Sam's grandma's recipe specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and like he made the matzo balls, he did everything. Um, the butternut squash soup actually is a recipe from Queer Eye, which I source in the in the text. Uh, if anybody's ever seen Queer Eye, there's an episode where he makes butternut squash soup and it's like unbelievable and so easy. Again, it's like a one pan thing you throw in the oven mm -hmm. and then you just blend it together. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and you know, what's really funny is I, I started looking at some of these, these recipes that are on here and it was like things that I wouldn't really think I would want to eat. But mm -hmm. then again, like I said, out, out of the two that I have cooked, I'm going to try and go through your entire book. Yeah. Actually, you know what I should do is I should send you my images that are not shot as beautifully as, of, <laughs> as yours. <laughs> Make a compare and contrast. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, the funny thing is with your air fryer wings, uh, the reason I did not follow your recipe is that I, I've been doing air fry wings for quite some time. And if any of you that are listening have not bought an air fryer yet, it's really just a fancy way for uh, a convection oven. Yeah. Um, I got mine from Best Buy. It was on clearance. I figured, you know, why not? I cannot like I, I air fry everything. I cannot get mm -hmm. enough of it. I mean, the fact that I can do French fries at home now is the best thing that has ever happened. Yeah. And everything's so much quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this is a, my mom's recipe. Okay. And you know, that's one of the things that every single time I read the, you know, make sure to get the green plantains. I don't know that I have ever chosen a plantain, but every time I have a dish, with plantain in it. I love it. Um, yeah, I grew up in Florida and it was kind of a staple at a lot of different restaurants, but I still am just not a plantain cooking guy. Mine always tend to be a bit, I don't want to say chalky, but they tend to be a bit um, flat. Is the you best have way to see. find them at the perfect ripeness of depending on what you're doing. If they're super green, that means mm -hmm. that they're um, unripe but they're ready for like tostones, which are more of like the, um, the savory version. Mm -hmm. And once it starts to ripen where the skin gets to get like legit black, like some people think like once the skin is black, it needs to go in the garbage. Like that is like, um, the worst thing you could ever do. If it's black, it means it's perfectly sweet and it's ready for like a sweet plantain. So when you get like sweet plantains at a restaurant, it's because it's super ripe. So it's two, it's mm -hmm. almost like two totally different, like, uh, thing like two totally different like I guess fruits and but it's like it just depends on like the ripeness that makes a lot of sense because yeah. I would always buy them and cook them the day that I got them home when they were ultra green and that's yeah, probably so that's like not sweet so they're going to be pretty <laughs> bitter um but you just have to cook them for that that style <laughs> look we're all learning today that is amazing um Let's go through another one that I saw that really. Yeah. So I actually went through like a sourdough phase as everybody did during quarantine. And so that the top one is a sourdough, a sourdough scrap dish. Um, so for people who like also went through that phase of making sourdough, you have to throw out half of your um, starter to continue creating more starter. And so I had a dish of um, kind of basically fried dough, fried starter dough. Um, delicious. <laughs> Yeah, I did not get into 
sourdough and I tried to start one after everybody got out of the craze and ended up with probably three pounds of just wasted dough that I, I I'm just not a baker. Yeah. Every time it's a little wasteful. <laughs> every time I cook, I, I like to say like, you know, exactly to your recipes, you know, a quarter teaspoon mm-hmm. or one teaspoon of this quarter cup of this. I always, for whatever reason, decide that I just want to throw a little bit, something extra. <laughs> and when you bake, that never works out uh, well. <laughs> it's like a true science. <laughs> So this was a gorgeous image. This is one of the ones that kind of drew me into the entrees. Um, So what do we have here? Um, So this is a Nashville style hot chicken, also Mm -hmm. fried in the air fryer. Um, But yeah, so like that was like one of the things I really wanted to pride myself and for this book, like, you know, kind of strive for a certain perfection where, you know, designing the plate, adding a little sauce on top in an actual symmetrical way. Like I really wanted to create something that was... Um, gave a wow factor. I didn't want to just put a book together. I really wanted to also force myself and challenge myself with the food photography aspect of it too. And and what resources did you use as kind of educational resources or inspiration for the way that you documented the process? Well, I, I, I'm luckily the position that I do have at b and like I get to meet a lot of different people, interviewing different people. I've met a lot of food photographers and gotten a lot of great tips from them, like Cheat Day Eats. She's actually going to be on a session uh, this week. Um, so I've just kind of been learning a lot from all other creators who do a lot of food photography and just kind of seeing the way that they um, compose their photos, the way the angles that they use and like the type of lighting. And there's like different tricks that you can do with if you do only have like one window to like put a white piece of paper on the other side as just like a reflector into the other side of the, the dish. So it's like kind of those little tricks that I learned that were insanely helpful. That's great. Yeah. One of the things that I liked so much is that <clears throat> as you went in, I printed most of the actual recipes. Um, I did uh, purchase the hardback from you, which I'm super excited to get. Uh, and for those of you that are on the show, I am sure we can drop a link in for Maria's book. Um, but as I went through and printed, one of the things that I liked a lot was the fact that I had kind of a reference image on a lot of these different mm-hmm. things to give me an idea of how to kind of uh I guess what, what the end result should look like. Um, and that was something that I found extremely useful. Uh, this one I thought <laughs> was absolutely amazing. And you know, one of the funniest things I've been married for 20 years this year. Uh, I still don't have a pizza cutter. Oh my God. <laughs> I, what, you know, what is wrong with me? You know, I, I, I've been up here for 13 years cooking pizza all the time for my family. And I end up having to get my giant butcher knife out and hack the pizza <laughs> <laughs> every time we come through. Um, so let's talk about your homemade pizza. This is something okay. that I would be really interested with a, you know, kind of New York, New Jersey mindset of what you feel is going to make a pizza, something that's really going to stand out. Yeah. So technically <laughs> this recipe is more of like my mom. So it's got kind of like a South American, my Fan, my dad's from Uruguay and my mom's from Colombia, but we eat a lot of like Uruguayan style food. So I guess this is kind of like a mix of South American style pizza, which is kind of Italian. There's a lot of immigration from Italy to uh, Uruguay. So um, it's more of that like sheet pan uh, pizza. It's not so thin, like not like New York thin. So you can tell the dough is a little thicker there. Um, but yeah, it is technically like my mom's recipe that now I use super easy. Um, but yeah, it's like just bread dough, add some sauce. Like the sauce also has a little bit of a, some specifics to it with sugar, making not so acidic. Um, and of course, burnt cheese. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, here's a question for you. Have you been daring enough to try to air fry a pizza? <sighs> no, I haven't. But I hear about it. I'm scared. <laughs> I, I am too. And you know, what's funny about mine, that, as I said at the top of the, the show, I bought one of the smaller ones at Best Buy. So I could probably do maybe eight to 10 wings in mine. Um, That's the only downfall I will say about a countertop. And I bought it specifically because of the size of our apartment and being able to try to store it. Um, But I'm I'm just super nervous to put a pizza in there. And I've read all kinds of great reviews about the air fry pizza. Um, But yeah, I'm glad to hear you're nervous as well. That makes (laughs) me feel a little bit better. Uh, So this is one that my daughter told me I have to cook tonight. So I've got some amazing. 
thawing out in the fridge, but we had a honey garlic salmon when we were on vacation and it just blew her mind. So I'm very excited uh, to That's try great. this one. Not a lot of kids like salmon. <laughs> I, I think it's the honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like, do you like broccoli? No. Do you like broccoli and cheese? Yep. I, I love it. <laughs> it. It's one of those type things. Um, so I have a, a question for you when it comes to the honey aspect of this. Do you marinate the salmon prior to cooking or is this just straight? Once you sear it, you throw the honey on at that point. Um, I do it prior. I usually I'll also use like a Ziploc bag and I'll throw all like the marinating uh, ingredients in there and leave mm -hmm. it overnight in the fridge. That way it like really sucks it in. And then um, you can use that juice also in the pan as well. Um, Cause the soy sauce will also kind of reduce and make it like sweeter as well. Okay. All right. Good to know. And you could do it on the grill too. I've done it on the grill, um, putting it in foil and kind mm -hmm. of throwing all the juice, everything in on in foil on the grill. And it's uh, unbelievable. It's a good summer now, thing. Are you a cedar plank salmon cooker or? No, I've wanted to try it though. I just haven't done it. Um, but I, I feel like I might be into that. Yeah. Well, I, I am a massive cedar plank salmon guy. And one thing I can tell you is you absolutely have to soak the cedar plank for quite some time. Mm -hmm. That was a hard lesson learned when I bought a bunch of cedar planks and did not do a test run and decided to cook for everybody a uh, 4th of July pre pandemic and charred all of the cedar. So we had burnt wood salmon. <laughs> <laughs> um, there we go. Oh, here's the Nashville hot chicken. All right. Yeah. That's from the, the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I see my, sorry, my computer's a little lagging. Um, the arugula and prosciutto cauliflower pizza. Now, is this something that you are trying to stay away from gluten or is this just something that um, you really just wanted to see what the cauliflower would taste like on a pizza? It's, just, it's mostly a health reason, you know, just trying to cut back a little bit on the bread, especially during quarantine when we were stuck inside <laughs> eating a lot of bread. Um, so it's more of like a health reason, but honestly, it's really good. And you can even find um, really good brands of cauliflower pizza to not also have to just make it yourself. There's like Kali Power is like the best brand. It's so easy. Uh, so you can basically make this exact thing, but just using pre-made cauliflower uh, crust. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to try that, but I'm... I'm it's gonna, good. I'm, it's really good. I'm a little bit of a pizza crust purist you know <laughs> um so here is the famous nashville hot chicken and if any of you that are watching this have had the opportunity to go to nashville and have their hot chicken uh it is something to behold i only have two friends and and maybe you might be the third maria but i only have two friends that can actually do the full-blown hot chicken um i literally took one bite of it and ended up having to unfortunately throw it away. It was the hottest <laughs> thing I've ever had in my life. Um, yeah. Um, we love Hattie B's in Nashville and they have like the different levels. Like I just do the regular hot, but mm. Sam, my fiance, he does like, it's called damn hot. And like, he's just crying the whole time and it's like happiness, but also pain, <laughs> but it's, it's intense. I've like yeah. seen videos of people like hallucinating. It's so hot. <laughs> That's just insane to me. And, and I see that you have Frank's on here. So, you know, Frank's I can deal with uh, any, anything in that caliber. Um, but once I go to the next tier up, uh, you know, it, it's a, a decision for, for pain, I guess is the yes. best way I can say it. So um, definitely not something I will ever be doing the damn hot. So this was pretty interesting. Spicy Dorito chicken quesadilla. Um, is this something that you would have had somewhere and you replicated, or is this just something that you thought would go extremely well together? I had a similar version of it with like the cool ranch Doritos. Um, but we love like the spicy Doritos. And, um, so we kind of made it our own, but I've had it somewhere else. Like I'm at a restaurant somewhere. Um, and we kind of made it our own and this is so good. <laughs> it's definitely a good like cheat day meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one of the things when, when I was a kid growing up, um, the kind of fun fried chicken that my mom would do was a uh, cornflake crushed up uh, into the, you know, drench. Mm -hmm. So when I started cooking, I was like, well, if cornflakes taste good, Doritos are going to taste better. 
So for a long time, I was making Dorito uh, fried chicken. Oh um, but, That's like but, such a college like meal. <laughs> oh my, it, you have no clue. And I think I probably ended up having like um, some sort of like powdered chocolate milk to go along with it. And then maybe some Funyuns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, so it's interesting, like photography wise with this was one of the things that are a little tougher to photograph because from the top, it's just like a tortilla, you know, there's really nothing. And it's kind of hard to photograph a quesadilla. And also it's not really like the prettiest dish. It's not like a burger that has like layers. It's just kind of like a bunch of stuff mixed together Mm -hmm. in there. So it was like a little bit, that's like one of those like challenging things, trying to find that perfect angle. So you can see most of it's like, I use like a 2.8 aperture trying to find like the sharpest, nicest part of it. But it's like one of those that's like hard to actually capture. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a bowl of chili. You mm-hmm, know, exactly. Tastes amazing, but you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily know that it's ever going to photograph extremely well. But, you know, that looks appetizing. And I think that was a, a great solution for how you approach that. And is this again, just using the window light? Yep. It's fantastic. Um, I do see that there's a question about um, asking how to self-publish a cookbook from Guillermo. Um, So just to go into that a little bit, um, it's actually really, really easy. Um, There is a lot of like websites just kind of like, I think I had started on like, it was, I think it was called like cookbook um, or makemycookbook.com or something like that. But I kind of wanted a very specific uh, sizing. And so um, then I went to a different, there's like really a ton. If you just kind of Google like publishing a cookbook, it's really, really easy. But I went into another one where I was able to design the cover um, exactly how I wanted it with the binding, how I wanted it. Um, so it was more of like, I wanted that that um, control in Photoshop. But if you don't, you know, you're not used to Photoshop, that's fine. You can still create the cover with these websites they have so many templates but I think it's like mycookbook.com or something is one of the best ones super easy it's really not too pricey um it was it was fine um so if you just kind of look into um the various websites I forget the one that I ended up using let me see if I can find it in the back but um but yeah, so really it's just like almost like a templated thing where you can uh, insert your photo, insert the recipe, they kind of template it out for you for the most part and it's easy. And you know, speaking of that, that, that brings a question for me. Um, were you able to get samples sent to you uh, or was it just pretty much when you laid everything out online, you just were like, all right, this looks good. I'm gonna order X amount um, and then they just went out. So the first, so I did actually get a sample from the one website and I didn't like how small it was, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So that's when I ended up going to a different website just because I wanted more of like an eight by 10 size. Um, The other one was more of like a, like an eight by like seven or something like that. It was like a little smaller. Um, So I want, and it was like a little pricier than the other version. So, um, but yeah, once I did design it, it was kind of like either you can pay a little extra to get a proof or you kind of just pray. And I decided <laughs> to go the pray route <laughs> and it was, it turned out great. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, you know, again, you know, it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to kind of see the, the melding, like you said, between your culture and Sam's culture and, mm-hmm. and what comes out of it. Uh, but you know, this looks about as Israeli as I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that definitely is something that I think is. is uh, and those are also air fried. Amazing. Yeah. Um, this is like one of the easiest things to make and we air fry them and I love them. How long does it take to air fry? Uh, very quick. <laughs> it's like quick. It's like, I don't know, eight minutes. Like it's, it's quick. That's amazing. Yeah. How long does it take? Very quick. Oh, it's very right, cool. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this. This was something okay. that I was extremely interested to find out what you do. Cause I've watched cooking show after cooking show. I've had pesto that has blown my mind. Uh, David Brommer's wife makes a pesto that is just out of this world. And every time I have tried to emulate it, I either get a thick paste that sticks to my teeth or I get a watery, like oily mess. So kind of walk me through your approach to pesto. Okay. Well, I personally, we, so there's also two different types of pesto you can make. You can do like a basil or a um, parsley um, and also pine nuts or walnuts. So like this one's like a 
um, parsley walnut one. So most people are used to a basil and pine nut. Um, I like the parsley. It's not as like kind of potent. Basil is very potent. Um, I really like the Italian parsley. So um, that's kind of what we do. Um, but I guess it's just kind of being careful in terms of like using too much olive oil, too much lemon juice. Um, and, but all of this is just kind of throwing it all in a food processor until it's like not too, too pasty, I guess, still has a little bit of texture to it. Um, but again, like these, the instructions are pretty foolproof. Like I, I really wanted to make sure that they were something that anybody can just truly read and just recreate. So even to, even now, like I always refer back to the book when I want to make certain things like the pesto or, um, like our, the Buffalo chicken dip, like I actually grab the book. I read the instructions cause I don't, I don't have it all memorized. So I really do use these recipes and these directions when I make them. That's great. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's the, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once your, your, your um, advice would be to just add more um, as you need mm -hmm. versus just dumping it all in. Yeah. And okay. this was actually another one that kind of like, it doesn't photograph as well. I was like, what can I add? Like I had a, a little like prop to the pesto, like a little flower, <laughs> a little walnut on top to kind of give it a little bit more life than just yeah. like kind of green stuff. <laughs> yeah, that that's amazing. Yeah, it's always really interesting to to think about the complexities of food photography mm -hmm. when it's done well, it looks super simple. And it's like, of course, that, that makes sense. And then you really think about it and... I'd like to know how, how many takes did it take before you were like, I need a yellow flower to contrast the green and I a need couple. the walnut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'll never forget when I was in, in school, one of our projects was we had to do an entire um, restaurant shoot. And it was very similar to what you're doing here, you know, appetizers, uh, entrees, desserts. And the hardest thing for me to do was to photograph the soup. And you did an excellent job with the butternut squash um but that was one of the things where the only solution that i had was throw a spoon in it mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's important to kind of create almost like that movement that was like kind of one of the things too like with the one with like the i think it's like mango salsa or something a lot of tips people give is actually create have somebody dipping into it and do like kind of like a faster shutter speed to get mm -hmm. the movement of it so you can kind of see um that it's salsa with a chip. It's not just like kind of salsa sitting there. You kind of add like a hand, um, adding a spoon. You can add it with soup. You can add like pepper and stuff to kind of give it a little bit of contrast. Like a lot of people will add like paprika to hummus because hummus is just like kind of just a little paste sitting there. So you add a little paprika, some contrast to add to the food. Um, so like, again, like this muffin that's here, it's like a muffin, just a muffin, but I want to see what's inside. Is it moist? Is it, what does the inside look like? So it's like breaking something open. You always see that with like cheese pull, like a mozzarella stick's just like a breaded stick, but the second you open it and the cheese is coming out, that's where you get that like wow factor of it. That's great. And you know, this right here is probably the closest thing that I've had to heaven. Um, is this a, is this a family recipe or is this something that you can oh, my mom with? made that one. My mom's like the queen of flan. It's so good. <laughs> She's so good at it. It's like, look at that thing. It's like unbelievable. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. You know, there, there aren't very many desserts that I like. I'm, I'm not a sweet type of person. I don't really care for ice cream. I don't care for a lot of things, but flan, key lime pie and a good bread pudding. Ugh. That's, it's just everything to me. And this looks amazing you should um, try uh andrea you know from also andrea from bnh uh her husband he makes the best key lime pie you could ever eat <laughs> well now i know who i need to yeah. kiss up to to get some good key lime pie. oh yeah it's so good oh it's amazing um so a vegan peanut butter brownie again was this just something that because you know i know you've definitely got some meat in here and, mm -hmm. and you you go across there is this just for taste is this something that you wanted to just you know mix in so you weren't constantly going to the cheat days so it's a little bit of both i weird like the muffins like the rest the recipe for the muffins are technically vegan depending if you add fruit or chocolate chips or whatever but i find using coconut oil over butter 
Um, I think to me, it like keeps it a little bit more moist, um, mm. is a little easier to work with. You can kind of melt it easier. Like I love to use coconut oil over butter for cooking. Um, these types of things like muffins or brownies or something like that. Cookies, you probably still need the butter, but um, I've just found like, I think it's so much easier to use coconut oil. Um, almond flour. I like almond flour just also just a health wise, just to not like overdo it on like regular flour. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like a little bit of, you know, health wise, but definitely just cause I actually choose to just, I'd rather use coconut oil. It's so much easier. Um, I see that there's a question from somebody about the flan asking what, uh, lens and focal length. Um, I used a 24 to 70 for that. Um, I was in like, uh, this wasn't in my apartment. It was at a, a, my parents' house. It was a huge window. So there was a lot, a lot of light. And I used a 2.8 because I really wanted to get kind of the air bubbles in the middle. Um, so again, for the most part, I use a 24 to 70 lens and the focal length is a 2.8. So you can see like the outside of the, the part of the, the cake is super out of focus. It's really just like focused on like that one section of the photo. So I, I, even though it's, it's tough, like 2.8, it just depends on what type of photo you're taking. If it's a whole table, you're obviously not going to use a, a focal, um, an aperture of 2.8 cause everything's going to be out of focus, but for specific dishes, that's what I always use just to really get certain, um, um, just certain like pieces of it to really, so you can really see it. But if I wanted a little bit more in focus, I would just move back a little and maybe zoom in a bit more just to kind of still keep the 2.8, but, um, not so I didn't lose that sharpness, but yeah. And it is, it is a great decision because it draws me right into the piece that I mm -hmm. want to cut out. And, you know, I don't have to think about anything other than the fact that this is going to be the most amazing thing that I've had all day. <laughs> um, that's great. And, and here we go, you know, probably my daughter's favorite thing on the planet, um, a Nutella crepe. And that is done exceptionally. Well, I hope that's Nutella. It is. <laughs> But we have um, a dairy-free crepe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So don't count the Nutella on top. You can kind of obviously put whatever you want. Sure. Like stuff it with whatever, but the actual crepe itself. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I feel like my daughter's in love with crepes because they're a conduit for Nutella or a conduit for all of the other sugars that come on top of it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that she's not a big waffle person. She's a big what goes on top of the waffle mm -hmm. <laughs> person. So strawberries and cream and powdered sugar. Yep. Um, yeah. So like, I feel like with the dairy free stuff, like there are some things like flour, you can't like a crepe, you really, it's hard to really replace the flour with an almond flour to make it healthier because it just won't kind of hold the same, but you can replace it instead of using regular milk. What's the difference if you using almond milk, it's like kind of the same thing it, for that purpose. Um, so why not make it dairy free? <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Now, do you do you use the upside down um, skillet technique or do you actually have a crepe pan? Um, no, I just use a regular skillet and I'm just super careful, I guess, with just making sure I pour very thin amount of um, of the batter so it's mm -hmm. not doesn't become a pancake. Um, but yeah, I've seen the upside down skillet and it's like genius. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it blew my mind. My, that's how my brother-in-law makes crepes. And yeah. the first time that he did it, I, I just was like, why would I ever buy a crepe <laughs> pan? This is yeah. absolutely amazing. So this is one of the ones that I am extremely excited to make. And, you know, a good challah bread is amazing. And this looks fantastic. That was actually my first time ever making it and like really braiding it and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so the only thing I will say with this is like, you definitely want to have, if you can, if you have one, it'd be great to have like an actual dough mixer um, because this is, it requires like a full 10 minutes of kneading. Mm. So like I had to, for 10 minutes, like I got a full arm workout doing this cause I don't have a bread mixer. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, that, that was one of the things that I thought was the, the muscle group that I had no clue. I had no muscles in and it was the kneading technique, you know, two minutes of kneading. You're like, okay, when is this going to end? Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. I don't think I could do that. I've made several homemade pizzas that just aren't quite as good as they should have been because mm -hmm. I was like, my forearms are done. Yeah. The original recipe I saw for hollow bread, it was like, set your timer for 10 minutes and do not stop. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a fantastic looking baguette and I wanted to show the image first, but then I want to go up to how simple it is. Yeah. I mean, 
it is probably one of the most simple and yet complex pieces of, I guess it want to be a piece, the, the most simple ingredient wise and complex flavor profile of anything mm-hmm. when you have a good uh, baguette. So is this something you do a lot or is this something that you just do occasionally? Um, I'd like occasionally, usually like when we make bread, it's more of like the pizza style bread. Like it's basically the same exact recipe as the pizza, just minus like the sauce and everything. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we'll make a baguette when we feel like it. And so this photo actually used a 16 to 35 because it's kind of crazy how small it looks in the photo. Um, but it's enormous. Like it's probably like a foot long or a little more. Um, it's probably close to like a foot and a half. That's how long like the actual baguette was. So for that one, I had to whip out the 16 to 35 because it was like impossible to get the shot that I really needed. Well, it it was, it was done fantastic. And that looks like a amazing breadboard that you have there as well. It's huge. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's like a, probably like a two and a half foot breadboard. (laughs) That's amazing. You know, that's one of the things that always impresses me. And I don't know how many of you that are currently watching this are in the greater New York City area. Um, Kitchens are very small in the vast majority of places. And and I'm lucky enough to be in a fairly large place for New York, but I still have a six foot by eight foot kitchen. Um, So we end up doing a lot of prep work in the dining room to then go into the kitchen to cook. Uh, You know, so small things in life, but my dream is to have a chef's kitchen at some point. And just to be able to actually have space for all of the uh, Maison Plans and get everything out where it needs to be before I cook. It's like that for me is the dream. And I would like to know when you get into this, do you do that? Do you set everything out that you'll need? Or are you one of the type of people that just kind of grabs as you go? Um, I usually, I, I do set everything out and I kind of got into that because of the cookbook almost, mm-hmm. because I also was like, uh, like, I don't like on my own Instagram while I would make some stuff. And while I was promoting the book, I would also create videos for some of these recipes and like kind of put them in my highlights. So I think I still have them up. Like if you go to my Instagram, um, I have a highlight for, um, recipes and I, ha- I created a bunch of videos for a bunch of, of these recipes and to create these videos, you need to have all your ingredients out, show what you're doing. And it kind of put me in that habit of doing the mise en place, like making sure you have everything out that way, everything's there. But I'm also very good about as soon as I use it, I put it away because of the limited space that we have. Like I don't have enough space to keep that certain thing there. It's got to go. As soon as I use it, it goes back in the, in the cabinet to create more space. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. You Um, know, you've made it when you have like a middle Island. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't need a mansion. I just need a middle island in right. my kitchen. <laughs> That's hilarious. And, and it's so funny. My, my wife and I were actually prepping this. I was going through your cookbook with her. And we were talking. And one of the things that we reminisced about was how excited we were when we got our very first New York apartment with a dishwasher. Um, and, it, you know, it's one of these type things of, like, we're now so grateful that we have a washer and dryer in the house and a dishwasher. But we're exactly at your point, Maria, at the point where we're like, when will we have an island in yeah. our kitchen like grownups? Uh, but what a great way to end the book with, with drinks. And, um, you know, some of these, they just look decadent. Like, I don't know how many of these you could actually have. The, you know, what, what is the kind of genesis of this uh, cocktail? So this, like the whipped coffee one. Mm-hmm. So the whipped coffee, like, I don't know if a lot of people remember also was like a big quarantine, like trend Hmm. Um, at the beginning. It was like when everybody started getting onto TikTok, like in March and April. And it was like one of the things it was like on the same uh, kind of wavelength of sourdough, everybody was making the whipped coffee. So I was like, well, I have to add it to the cookbook (laughs) if everybody's talking about it. And it's actually really, really good. I'm a big coffee person, like kind of a coffee snob, very into espresso. Um, so the whipped coffee is like really easy to make. Um, like you can see the ingredients are so short, but um, yeah, it is a little bit heavier, but if you kind of use dairy-free um, milk, if you want, you don't have to spike it. You know, I just spike it because why not? It's five o'clock somewhere, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So this, this like drink is awesome. I love it. So, you know, I must've missed that. I, I was not aware that there was a, a whipped coffee trend going on during yeah. the pandemic. Um, so here, here's my question if you're a coffee snob, uh, Nespresso or no Nespresso? No Nespresso. Wow. 
it's I good. I was not expecting that. It, it is good. But the machines, like you're kind of just so dependent on a machine mm-hmm. rather than kind of just buying your own coffee. I love to try different coffees. Like if I go in a, into a cafe that like I've never tried before and like I have an espresso, I'm like, wow, this is so good. I'll buy the beans or I'll buy the ground, the ground espresso so I can take it home and make it myself. I can't really do that with an espresso machine. You're kind of um, dependent on the pods that they give you. And if like your machine isn't working for whatever reason, it's malfunctioning because like it's like a whole thing, you're not going to have coffee that day. <laughs> so okay, um, fair point. I'm very into just having like, I have like a $75, like um, it's a um, just like an older espresso machine. All it does mm-hmm. is create, make one, like a double shot of espresso. That's all it does. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love to try new coffee. So that's why I'm like anti it. But when I do have it, it is delicious. Like it is, it tastes amazing, but well, it's funny that you you said that being dependent on the machine. Um, exactly eight days into lockdown, our espresso machine broke. Um, and we had the old tried and true stovetop. Um, I have that so too. We, we were having to make coffee for both of us. My wife and I are both mm-hmm. coffee addicts as well. Um, and we were spending so much time using that that I just broke down and, and I bought a, an espresso. <laughs> and what was funny is the actual espresso machines were five to six weeks back ordered and wow. Nespresso I got in six days. Um, so I don't think a lot of people had caught up to the Nespresso that early on into the mm-hmm. pandemic. Yeah. And I do also have like the stovetop espresso machine, like kind of like the old school Cuban way. Um, mm-hmm. It's delicious. I love it as well too. Yeah. That, that was kind of it, what, one of the things that got us through that, that first kind of month was the fact that we were making a uh, coffee con leche uh, every day. And it just took us back. Uh, we're lucky enough to have family in Puerto Rico. Um, and every time we go to Puerto Rico, that was, you know, there was just no ifs, ands, or buts. That was what was served to us every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am a, just an absolute nut for Turkish coffee, Vietnamese coffee, you know, any of the like coffee, con leche, any heavy, yeah, thick, creamed, oh, definitely Same. not good for your waistline. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will have to say that we made this um, as, nice. I, as I went through your book, and this was fantastic. I had never thought of combining champagne and bourbon in a drink ever. So um, this came from because I love an Aperol spritz. Like, I love them so much. But Sam, my fiance, isn't that into them. And he's a big, very, uh, he's a bourbon snob. He only drinks bourbon. I was like, well, what if I just throw bourbon in it? Will you like it? <laughs> and he did. So, um, so that's where this one came from. <laughs> Well, it was funny because, you know, as, like I said, as I was going through your book to kind of research uh, ahead of this, um, we're really lucky that just a half a block away from us is um, the liquor store we've been going to for a decade and he has an amazing selection. So I already had plenty of bourbon at the house. Um, <laughs> so I just picked up the Aperol and the yeah. champagne and it was insanely refreshing. If any of you that are watching this have not made this drink, I'm going to leave it up for a minute. <laughs> this is a fantastic summer drink. To Maria's point, though, if you are not a bourbon fan, um, it is definitely bourbon Ford. Um, I actually tasted the bourbon, and it, I, it could also be that I had Blantons in there, you know, so it was a little bit more of a bourbony bourbon, mm-hmm. um, but it was a very bourbon Ford, but extremely refreshing drink on the terrace, so highly yeah. recommend it. And you could just remove the bourbon if you're not into it. Mm-hmm. And this is something I had never heard of. Um is this, uh, it's a fun play on the French 75. Yes. Um, so do you know the history of the French 75 and, and how it came about? Not so much. So it, the French 75 is named the French 75 as Americans were in World War I and could not get their, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind, uh, Tom Collins. Um, but what was very, very apparent and everywhere in France at the time was champagne. Mm -hmm. So they just simply used champagne in it and thus came the French 75. Um, You know, it's, it's a good drink, but I, am not really a orange juice and champagne person unless it's brunch. Mm -hmm. I I just, it's the same with, for whatever reason, a um, Bloody Mary is the same thing. Like if I'm not sitting down having brunch, I don't want a Bloody Mary, (laughs) but it's a, a, a good drink. And that is a excellent photograph. Um, So this looks like you had some uh, artificial light. How did you photograph this? This was a a flash as well because it was nighttime um, because it was kind of a a nighttime drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, I used a speed light on the camera. 
Very cool. Spiked seltzer. That's about as straightforward as you can get. <laughs> it's a spiked spike <laughs> seltzer. <laughs> um, and that is a good way to, I guess, take your, your white claw or your truly or whatever your uh, seltzer of choice is uh, and elevate it just mm-hmm. a slight bit. I really enjoy this. How, how did you shoot this and what, what was your setup? Um, so I don't think I, I didn't use any artificial light. Um, so the, the one thing with drinks, there are, they are a little tough, especially clear ones are a little tough to photograph. You kind of really want to focus on the bubbles. That's kind of what's going to give it that, um, that it's a cocktail or that it has some sort of, um, um, club soda or something. So, and I wanted to, but uh, without, so I took a little bit of a rind of a lemon, to, you know, give it a little bit of a pizzazz um, because or else it would just look like a cup of club soda, not so much like a cocktail. Um, So that, yeah. So again, like all these, all of these are mostly shot in a a really fast aperture, like a 2.8. And so I could capture kind of the details. So I really wanted to capture the bubbles. I didn't, it wasn't really about the white claw, but I wanted that in the back. So that's something you can do is have diffuse, have out in the back a, um, a prop or whatever so it's out of focus but it's kind of still there you can see it and all the focus is on the bubbles and have a little bit of a prop like the lemon rind just to you know make it fancy that it is a cocktail yeah that's great and it's an, it's an excellent composition and I, and I really love kind of the play of the, the yellow against the orange um and then like you said it would have been a very bland photograph yeah. w- w- without that and then that brings us to the end of your book so i'm going to jump back over stop sharing um let's see we have a couple of questions oh i think you got them all to it um some of them no well somebody asked uh, if the cookbook is available for purchase yeah so we'll throw the link in there um i do still have a couple books left so um it can be uh, available for purchase and i can also um i also have the digital version as well available so they're there and this is an excellent question um maria what cooking means for you and what is your absolute favorite dish to make? Um, well, cooking for me means kind of, it's a sense of like fulfillment as well. You know, it's so easy to just kind of buy food, really great food that, you know, is amazing. It is still home cooked by another chef or something, but there's just something so fulfilling about like, you know, taking the time, buying all the ingredients or something and, you know, putting your mind to a project. And I kind of love that at the end, especially with things that are a little bit more complex and, you know, like a sourdough bread is actually really tough to make. And like, when you finally make it, you're like, wow, like I did this, I made this. I was like so obsessed with like my breads when I finished. Um, so for me, it is like a kind of, it's a a little, it's a small win, you know, it's kind of, uh, just something that makes you feel good that you created something out of nothing and that's like one of my favorite things to do. And that kind of goes with photography and videos. Like one of like my favorite thing to do is make something out of nothing. And it goes with food, goes with photos. Like, you know, you had the, the vision of a photo or the vision of a composition with a dish and like props and everything. And then you see it and you're like, I did it. Like, you know, I, I made that. And um, so it's like almost like a double, I made that. I made that dish and I made this photo. So um, I kind of just love that about food and photography. Together. That's great. Yeah. And, and I completely understand where you're coming from. I, I have a, a great love of cooking and I have two older sisters. So the one thing that they taught me was, you know, the best way to uh, win a woman's heart is to cook her an amazing <laughs> dish. Uh, and unfortunately, as I was wooing my now wife, I cooked all the time. for her. And it, it, we, we cooked more than we went out a because she was in her master's program. We didn't have a lot of money and B I was trying to win her over. Uh, and 20 years later, I'm still the primary cook in the house. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it can be a positive thing, but um, it is extremely rewarding, like you said. Uh, and it's, it's even more extremely rewarding when you make something like I did with your, your cookbooks that we had never had before. Um, and it can really diversify and, and bring some, some you know, new light into the same old, same old. I, I find myself, unfortunately, um, pre-pandemic, you, know, you get home from work at seven o'clock. Uh, kids hungry everyone's hungry you don't know what to do and it's like all right we're gonna have pasta and garlic bread again mm-hmm. um so that was kind of my uh i wouldn't say it was my favorite thing to cook but it became one of my staples is that we were pasta fiends 
Uh, and luckily the the pandemic has kind of broken us of that because we've had a little bit more time to focus. Yeah. Uh, for all of you that are in the room, please do um, submit any questions that you have. We have about 10 minutes left with Maria before we transition over to Alan Shapiro. Uh, so drop any of those questions in you might have and we will do our best to kind of uh, I, come in and out. I do see another question about okay. copyright issues with branded products. I'm assuming you're meaning like the White Claw. So there definitely is issues with that, but it's more of like I specifically made this book for not non-for-profit. So that's kind of where that like... Uh, that goes. If you're selling this for profit, then yeah, you would probably want to kind of cross your T's, dot your I's in terms of branded products. Like I made this book for a um, specifically nonprofit project. It's for, you know, family, friends, and, um, but I sold it for proceeds to go to charity. So um, this book is 100% zero proceeds, one for profit. So I think that's kind of where you need to be careful when it comes to cookbooks. Yeah, and that, that's a really good thing uh, that you brought that up. And uh, the, the, excuse me, that you did not bring that up. That, that question was asked. Um, it is always better if you're going to produce anything for profit, uh, like Maria said, to err on the side of caution. Uh, I have heard of some crazy things that have happened with photographers, and you know, it five six years later after a project was done, uh, then getting uh, some legal things. So I I you know, would definitely look into that a bit more. And I'm not a copyright lawyer, so I would not be the person to answer <laughs> that, but it could get messy. Um, and we had one question about a specific dish and I am going to completely butcher the pronunciation. Do you want me to do it? <laughs> please. <laughs> um, he's asking if, um, so Guillermo is also asking me if I know how to cook ropa sucia. Um, well, I know about ropa vieja, which is a Cuban dish. Um, so I have never made it. I've been to Cuba and I've had a lot of it. And uh, I actually have a Cuban restaurant right next door to my apartment. So I also eat a lot of it, um, but I've never made it. So I mm. should definitely, I'll do that one next. <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite dishes. And, and what's really funny is both prior to moving to New York City, uh, I lived in a place called Lake Wiley, South Carolina. And there was a Cuban family. Um, they, they were three generations owned an amazing restaurant. And the owner and head cook refused to let me order until I could say it properly. So I'd always say, Ropa Vieja. And he's like, no. <laughs> and I was like, please, it's so good. Um, does that literally translate to dirty clothes? Am, am I correct with that? Or Old clothes. Old clothes. Yeah, has old. Got it. Okay. But the one he's saying is Ropa Sucia when that is dirty clothes. <laughs> Got it. And if, if any of you that are watching this have not done yourself the favor of going to a Cuban restaurant and ordering either of those dishes, please stop what you're doing, find a <laughs> Cuban restaurant and do it. it. I mean, it's one of the few dishes that I eat like it's Thanksgiving to the point where I can feel it coming up in my chest, but I just <laughs> keep eating it and eating it. It's so good. Um, and Gino asked, what was the charity that you were giving the profits to? Yeah. So I did like basically three rounds of, um, promoting the book. The first round was for COVID relief. Um, so it went to, um, the hospitals. Um, so this was like in May of 2020. So, um, all the proceeds went to the hospitals for COVID relief. Um, the second round, I did it for a Black Lives Matter um, charity. And then the third round, after we had collected enough money to both those charities, it was kind of a charity of your choice. So that's what it is now. It's more of like when people purchase, it's um, any charity of their choice. And I kind of send it over to wherever. That's, that's really good. So yeah, that's one of the best ways with nonprofits that, that I found is the, the charity of choice is, is always so good because for a lot of what I've been doing has been uh, No Kid Hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that uh, the great folks at Whalebone Magazine started as soon as the pandemic kicked off and they were giving a huge amount of their profits there. Uh, so I became involved and actually have done a little bit of volunteering uh, cool. to go through, but I was unaware. Um, and I'm not sure if you were or how many people are, but I was extremely unaware that in New York City, close to 60% of the public schools, the children are living on the free meals. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a massive uh, initiative to make sure that the kids were actually able to be fed uh, during that time period. Um, so that is something that was near and dear to my heart. So I'm happy that you are opening that up for everybody. That's great. Um, That's awesome. Going backwards, you answered part of the question, but 
what's your absolute favorite dish? What is your, like, oh, if, yes. <sighs> if you're going to cook for me, you're going to cook for somebody. It's a special occasion. What would the absolute favorite dish be? Um, yeah, I guess it depends. Like they're all so good They're And they're all like for different occasions. Cause I do like the empanadas specifically that I have in this book are like a shrimp chorizo mix. So like, usually when you go buy an empanada, it's usually chicken, beef, cheese or whatever. So I wanted to kind of, you know, elevate it to something that nobody's ever really had. And it was a uh, shrimp and chorizo empanada. And it's like such a hit always. Um, people love it. That's like one of my favorite ones to kind of make. And, um, I don't have like a lot of my friends are like American or like Italian and other not not many of them are have like a, a Latino descent so they love it. Um, the buffalo chicken dip is like the one we have to bring everywhere. Um, everybody loves it. Everybody's always like you have to bring the buffalo chicken dip. So that's always like the staple, and it's so so good. Um, so that, those are definitely two of my favorites. And then the ones that I make kind of the most often is like the banana muffins, mostly because, you know, everybody's always got like a banana that's going bad. Um, so it's like the best way to just kind of make something that's delicious, use that one banana and it uh, you can make a great like uh, 12, um, 12 muffins that will last you the week. Um, so those are the three that are like kind of the favorites. That's amazing. And the buffalo chicken dip is something that I intentionally only cook during football season because I will eat an entire pan. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one of the things I'm really excited about this football season. Hopefully we're going to open back up and be able to have friends over. Um, you know, the, the idea of a giant buffet uh, for a big game in my tiny apartment does not sound too good right now, but it, we, we are getting there. Um, but I have a friend who lives around the corner and she's from Pittsburgh and she makes the absolute most insane buffalo oh. chicken dip. Um, so if any of you have not had that dish, do yourself a favor and become addicted like we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we are coming close to the end of our session today. So if there are any last minute questions that you may have for Maria, please do throw them into the Q and A or into the chat module. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Maria, if you wouldn't mind dropping a link uh, sure. into the chat for your uh, book, that would be fantastic for everyone. Perfect. And everyone that is in the room, next up, we will have Alan Shapiro. Uh, he is an amazing photographer, uh, all around great guy. And he and I have a shared friend, Matt Hill, uh, who is another amazing person. Uh, so it is quite hilarious to me how large this industry is, how big the photography world can be. And yet you're no more than two to three people away from somebody that knows somebody that you're friends with. Uh, so it is great. Uh, oh, Helen says, yay. Yeah. Well, it's because great I, people attract great people, John. Come on. <laughs> they, they do. And, you know, speaking of great people attracting great people, I know this is not food related, but I had the absolute pleasure with Maria to go to the outpost a couple of years ago. Um, and it was one of the most amazing experiential activities that we had done. And Maria, do you think we, we had five or 10 minutes during the day of downtime? Um, it no. was just. <laughs> that constant. is like still one of my favorite trips, like of all time, like yeah. of all time. <laughs> and that was also a gastronomic, amazing event to be able to, to cook so well for, I think that at the time there was 700 people there uh, for the event we went to uh, and Bullet Bourbon had mm -hmm. their little toe behind trailer making craft cocktails. So um, always impressed when people can cook well, such as yourself, Maria, even more impressed when people can cook to that level of scale, making sure that everything's fresh and making yeah. sure that everything can come through. So if any of you are on this call, are professional cooks or chefs or caterers, tip my hat to you. <laughs> I have never been able to get anything out sequentially. I'll end up making the hamburgers and the French fries aren't done for 15 minutes. <laughs> or I'll have the soup out. Everybody's been done eating for quite some time. Um, but my mother did teach me the best way for people to applaud your cooking is to make sure they're nice and hungry at the dinner party. So that is the last bit of advice I will give. Maria, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you even more for the cookbook. Uh, great recipes. I love the fact that you are supporting the, the frontline workers, the uh, industry of uh kick cooking and everything that goes through with it and then that you transitioned over to uh whatever the people would like to have 
I hope there's going to be a second cookbook, uh, Cooking As We Come Out of Quarantine. Could we title it that? I mean, I definitely already have like a running list of new recipes I want to add just in case that it comes to that. So maybe, I, I hope so. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to seeing you again in person, uh, I believe next week. And um, we will get back to having some fun cooking talk. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. You are very welcome. And I have actually gone over a little bit of my time. So if you are good, Alan, I think we will just transition straight into your time uh, and we'll just keep running. Whatever works. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, robots and artificial intelligence, thank you for joining us today for the B&H Photo Food Week. Uh, I, we are very lucky to have Alan Shapiro with us. Uh, Alan is a amazing photographer, all around great guy. Um, and I am interested to get into the Zen mentality of your Zen photography. Is that it? That's my, that's my intro? <laughs> yeah. I, I can go a little bit more in depth if you'd like. No, 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 that's good. I just saw. So here's what I, we didn't have a chance to discuss ground rules ahead of time. It's really weird presenting to your computer camera mm -hmm. with, you know, and you have to look over to the chat. So I want to be interrupted. I want you to do what you did at the end with Maria. Sure. And I want anyone who, if anyone's out there, please ask lots of questions because I want this to be a dialogue much more than a monologue. When I talk to myself, I feel like I'm just crazy. And we've had a year and a half of that. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, you heard it uh, from Alan directly. Please, anything that comes up as he is presenting, anything that you think of, even if it is just a kind word or a question, uh, drop it into the Q&A module or into the chat, and I will do my part to interrupt Alan and get the questions for all of you answered. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully when we have time in the end, I have, I have like props that I want to share and, you know, little tips and tricks, but I want to show the work first because you know, people won't care about the tips and tricks if they don't like the work and what's possible. So we'll do that. We'll do that right this second. Let's go into desktop mode. And John, if you could just confirm that you're seeing enough of my screen. I am, looks beautiful. Perfect. Okay. So I have only been a photographer for about 11 years now. I grew up as a career advertising chief creative officer. It was my day job. And as you might imagine, it gets kind of stressful. So a very dear friend of mine, a professional photographer, gave me a camera as a gift and said, go out and you know, find, find something else that you can focus on. And he did. And I found this all-consuming passion for photography. So that's how I got started. But I didn't, I didn't know about food photography, per se, because you know, there, were, there were trained professionals who I was dealing with. And in my world, working with major Fortune 50 you know, companies like Nestle and Domino's Pizza and, and Burger King, you had a team of on your, on your food photography shoots. You had multiple stylists and assistants and people who were just shoppers and then the prop stylists versus the food stylists. So it was a major production back in the day. It was intimidating. So it was only a little bit later that I started. Here's the first tip, never shoot on an empty stomach. And as the nice Jewish boy that I am, I made you all cookies and brought you some milk. And if you don't like cookies and milk, how about some, uh, this is homemade hazelnut filled ravioli with a little bit of raspberry sauce in between. If you don't like that, here are some bourbon apple cider donuts. Uh, with a side of spike cider. And for those people who are trying to be a little bit healthy, here's some, you know, fresh fruits and dry, actually dried fruits and fresh nuts. Um, and here's the fresh fruit. So just a little snack to get us started. As I said in the beginning, stress is uh, sort of omnipresent for many people I work with and hang out with given the year and a half we've come through and you know, given the transition we've all had to uh, deal with. And hopefully a few of you can relate. And so for me, you know, how did I deal with stress? I became a stress eater. And so I was eating out 
before the pandemic quite a lot. During the pandemic, I was ordering in quite a lot. Even though I love to cook, I felt like I needed, I needed a little bit of self-care and that meant sort of ordering in. It was a sort of an everyday luxury that I'm, I'm thankful I had. Um, but as I was working with myself in my kitchen, just playing, because I do like to cook, I started noticing like textures and colors. And, and this was before I even had a macro lens per se, but I would just look at things and really enjoy what was happening in a frying pan. And that, so I would grab a camera and, and see what would happen. And I liked composing things. And I think because I grew up as an art director, you know, layout is important and positioning on a page and color and, and rhythm and pattern became important. So even then working with, you know, store-bought pear jam and some shaved cheese, and by the way, blueberries make everything better, which is a whole theme I'm gonna to touch on later. It became a fun little exercise in composing things and the, comp the composing, the making of them so relaxing to me. And so that's where this idea of Zen sort of started happening. And so I would do it a lot and I would start buying extra things that I wouldn't normally want to have in the house, but you know what? They were pretty, they were colorful, they were very textural and added a different element to a composition. And then I also started um, not, not using tin foil as much because I found that the, the older and cruddier my baking sheets got, the more beautiful they became. So I became obsessed with sort of creating ancient baking dishes from brand new ones. And I want you all to kind of pay attention as I skip through things to see some of, you know, a lot of the surfaces I shoot on for myself are, are just, you know, baking dishes that I had in the house and was able to work with and manipulate the color, uh, you know, with, with studio lights or ambient light or in post-processing. But a lot of this turned into how do I take the stress eating and make it an opportunity? And so I would literally find restaurants and I would call up the chef and I would say, I really like this thing that I've discovered called food photography. Can I come visit and spend time in your kitchen or spend time in your restaurant? And I'm not going to charge you anything, but just like, you know, show me your best dishes. Let's play together. And if you choose to, you know, if you want one when we're done, I'll trade you a picture for a meal. You buy two pictures, it's two meals. So I get to take my wife to be out for dinner. You buy 20 pictures. I am hanging out with you for a few weeks. And that became just an easy way of getting into food photography. So you don't always have to find major clients who have significant budgets. You can just go in and kind of barter and trade and practice um, in the field. And of course that led to more, more paying gigs and, and then working on cookbooks. And so sort of documenting an entire process from the cooking to the plating and ultimately, you know, whatever, whatever I was able to develop with either the chef or by myself, that, that turned into a career of sorts. So in this case, just grilling some fruit and um, some home, some ma mascarpone cheese with some honey thrown in and then honey on top. And it was just an exercise in what can I play with that would look interesting. And you'll know, for me here, I have this affliction, which I've dubbed perfection paralysis. I hate looking at my work over and over again, because every time I look at it, I find something that I want to redo. In this case, I'm looking at this fresh, and God, I hate the background. So it's almost something that I want to throw out and start over and recreate. So that's something that, that I deal with. Um, and so that led me to very different clients. This happens to be a Bloody Mary. This goes back a, a couple of years to when molecular gastronomy was sort of taking off and we were jellifying things and freeze, that's freeze-dried horseradish. Um, 
not a particularly good shot, but you know, just something that that speaks to me. And and God, I I don't really miss those days, but I miss those days. And even now, just putting out Sunday brunch for you know myself, if friends come over, if the kids are over, it everything becomes a plating exercise and and a little bit of a of a joyful excursion into where should I put the smoked sable relative to the whitefish relative to this or that. Here is a different take on breakfast when it was bougie and fancy, but what I started noticing as I was doing a lot of these more professional gigs is the stress was coming back a little bit, you know, because you, you've got a finite amount of time in a kitchen before something fades and, um, and or it's busy because you're working on a line and, you know, wait staff is coming and going. And so you only have a few seconds with the food. Um, so let me take a diversion here. Uh, but so I was getting stressed. This is something um, that I don't know why I'm drawn to it. It's actually bone marrow with caviar and creme fraiche. It was from a very elaborate week long shoot with City Harvest who was hosting, you know, famous chefs for a week of, you know, for charity, raising money, uh, things. That same chef a little bit later, bone marrow was a theme, made probably, I think, 500 bone marrow creme brulees. And all of a sudden a frantic waiter comes running in and said, we have a vegetarian, we have a vegetarian. And like the kitchen froze. And then all of a sudden, like without anybody saying a word, like three different people ran to three different coolers and pulled out fruit and mint and some edible flowers and threw this together amidst this carnivorian, you know, dessert uh, thing, this, this lone plate of fresh berries that were, you know, marinated in some ancient balsamic vinegar and, you know, some whatever fresh squeezed juices. It was just an interesting thing to see that happen. Um, more plated food. And so at some point I decided, you know, I could actually deliver really well done food to clients. But again, I was, you know, feeling a little bit stressed. And so I said, you know what, I need to, I need to start distinguishing between my client work and how I deal with it and my personal work. And that led to a whole different way of shooting and an attitude towards shooting. Because if you think about it, when you're dealing with clients, they have expectations. You know, they've either seen your work or they've heard about you and they know what they want. Whereas with my personal work, I had nothing necessarily definitively in mind. So it was, it was very liberating to look at developing unexpected solutions rather than expected solutions. And whereas working with clients is about precision and efficiency because sometimes you have multiple shots to get done in a limited amount of time with a limited team, when I'm doing work for myself, it's very relaxed and it's almost therapeutic and I can spend as much time as I want and I can throw things away and start over. And you know, with a bigger team, that's not necessarily easy to do. And as I mentioned, there are deadlines. Whereas when I'm working for myself, there are never deadlines. I could leave something, if it's non-perishable, I could leave it set up for days and keep coming back and tweaking it. And there's something very wonderful about that aspect of getting distance from your work, about setting something up, especially if it's more of a fine art thing, and then shooting it and then looking at it and then walking away and taking some time and, get, and getting distracted and then coming back and looking at it with fresh eyes. Um, when I work with clients, it's about making them smile. When I work for myself, it's about making me smile. Like, where do I want to focus? That's a no brainer. With clients though, it's a business and you know we want to make money and we want to be perfect right we, we need things to be perfect and or perfected when i'm working for myself it's about pleasure versus business i'm making art or i'm making mistakes intentionally big glorious mistakes and i'm not perfecting necessarily i'm practicing so let's look at some of those things um peas and merlot salt and an old baking sheet just uh, you know it such a relaxing, colorful experience for me to lay down a couple of pea pods, decide which one needs to be cracked open. Sometimes even just the act of opening snap pea pods 
and looking for the perfect one is, is this like very meditative thing. Because you may have to go through a couple of bags of snap peas before you find the perfect one. But when you do, oh my God, now everything sort of, now the, the, the energy starts flowing and, you, and you, now you have to really work quickly because you know it may, it may start to wrinkle and you know, disintegrate slightly. Um, likewise, figs. And as I keep saying, blueberries make everything better. So here I have a lot of friends who are ceramicists, who are local potters, who um, I go in and I say, show me something you've never, like you wouldn't sell and or color combinations that you don't think are saleable or that were mistakes, like give me your mistakes and let's make something with them. And then again, it's a trade. I'll give you back a pretty photo that you can use to promote your craftsmanship. And in exchange, I have this never ending supply of props. So there's that. John, any questions? Everybody's really quiet. No questions. You're just getting a ton of accolades. Um, people are saying that, thank God I already have eaten. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, what, I, what I can say though, this hasn't come up uh, from any of the viewers, but I would like to know um, on your previous overhead shots of the food, yeah the Rembrandt lighting is so unbelievably gorgeous. Is this something that you took from portraiture or is this something that you have developed specifically uh, to highlight each of the dishes that you're doing? Um, I, so I don't know if you could tell from our brief few moments live, but I live in on the, uh, I have the top floor of an apartment here in New York and I have a, full wall of northern exposure light. So I have the most beautiful ambient light throughout my home, um, but that's only when it's daylight. And, you know, so I shoot at all hours. So I, I, have a, I use a combination of natural light when I can, but I also am a huge fan of continuous LED lighting as opposed to strobe. And this all started from, do you remember a number of years, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had a Renaissance portrait show? I mean, that just like changed my world because even though I studied art history in college when I was back at RISD, seeing such an overwhelming amount of Renaissance portraiture just fuck with me. I was blown away, I was mesmerized. And so I don't know that I, you know, processed in my own brain that I could recreate portrait lighting for food, I think I just went with the moodiness and the directionality and the contrast and, and the richness. And I, I really don't want to necessarily recreate reality when I'm shooting for myself. With clients, it's very different. You know, we want to be more natural. But so I wanted a more painterly approach. I wanted a more colorful approach or even a more faded muted approach because I've, I'm constantly playing with trying to recreate that show in my mind. And so in some cases you'll notice here, you know, very saturated and colorful. In others that you'll see later on, you know, it's, it's more the faded uh, start of it. But again, it's all directional continuous LED light um back to this sometimes i just look at round foods and i say why are they round and one day i just it was a rainy day and i was up early and i just started cutting everything that i'd gone shopping for the day before into squares and i had literally hundreds of carrots that had been hundreds of pieces of carrots and beets and lotus root and onions getting an onion to hold its shape as a square is a challenge. You see that center onion. I mean, like, I think that piece is sort of hanging on by a, by a prayer. Um, but there was something fascinating about this food Jenga to me, you know, just balancing things naturally, then looking at the imperfection. There's a wabi-sabi nature to, to some of this because it, I don't want things to be absolutely perfect, but I want, I want you to look and say, oh, I never thought about it like that. And, and then I want you to smile and say, oh, I could do that. But don't do that. Do something else that's different because I've done this already. Um, this led to playing with mandolins, you know, like because my knife skills are good, but a mandolin lets me get thinner. And just looking at 
presenting vegetables in this case in the range of colors they come in. I mean, a trip to the farmer's market in Union Square here in New York City um, can be fascinating at high season because you can get, you know, 20 different colors of beets. You can literally make a, you know, like a rainbow of beet colors if you, if you hit the right number of farmers at the right time. And there's just something very beautiful and, and simple to me about laying a bunch of slices out and moving them around and then kind of making them whole in this case with the, the top and tail ends. And you know, I want, I want people looking who are, who are here to appreciate how simple this is. This is a trip to your supermarket made simpler. It's a trip to your, to your refrigerator if, you, if it's stocked with vegetables and just start playing around with what you've got and see what you can create. Um, in this case, you know, there were, there were these micro-sized garlic, like I'd never seen them so small. These are about the size of your, you know, from your, your thumbnail to your pinky nail. And then some baby carrots that were, you know, part of the circus sideshow, which at this point in time, I actually have a couple of, of farmers who saved me their, their more exotic, um, their freakier vegetables because I just love them so much. I mean, you know, I, there's, a, there's a book in this at some point. But again, presented very simply. Now, sometimes I do bring friends to shoots. My, my baby girl, my daughter, is actually starting vet school in two weeks. So I'm really proud of her, but, you know, she had a very long and interesting journey filled with, and our home was filled with all manner of exotic critters, from snakes and lizards to big hairy spiders, and when I moved into my home here, she gave me Persephone, who you see here, as a housewarming gift. She said she's going to keep you company. She's going to scare away any intruders. Um, she doesn't really bite if you're gentle. And I was freaked out because I'd never had my own tarantula. I just indulged her in her room from arm's length. But, you know, she became an... Uh, a bit of a fascination with me. And because she was so still and seemed so calm, one day I made the decision to take her out of her cage. I'd never done it. So I'm there with the biggest industrial size spatula I could get and a pair of extra long barbecue tongs, just in case. I felt like a lion tamer, but I had her on the spatula and I put her on set with the idea that you know, solitary, tarantulas are solitary creatures and, and maybe she needed a friend. So I took her dating in my conceptual world and I thought, who would she like? And so I found on a shopping trip, a couple of rambutans that reminded me of her. I mean, they were a little bit brighter colored, but they were just as hairy. And, you know, so I thought to put them together and this is the result. It was one of the more charming and, and, high tension shoots because I didn't know how she'd react. Um, the good news, and I don't know if this is replicable, but she was so docile that I could literally tap her leg to get her to raise it up and she would hold it there. So she was so gentle and or so trusting or I just got really lucky, but I was able to sort of manipulate her into all sorts of you know wonderful poses. And this is just, you know, a portion of that. Needless to say, when you grow up with a daughter who's into exotic animals, which included cephalopods and seafood of sorts, you know, I, I developed a fascination for octopus, but I like to eat it, not keep them at home. I couldn't, couldn't do that. Although I think I may be able to at this point, I think I've got the means. So I just started playing with octopus. They're fascinating. I actually did a shoot with my 14 year old son a number of years ago where I put a live octopus or a fresh octopus, it's not live, but you know, right, not cooked on his head, giant six foot oct octopus that literally covered his face. It was the most fun, torture filled thing you can do to a teenage boy. So I highly recommend that if there are any parents in the, in the room, get your children to pose with an octopus. Um, but some of these are just simple shots that, you know, I've got a collection of all sorts of old dinged things that reminded me of myself and thought, what can I do with 
the octopus. So variations is another thing that we'll talk about in a little bit. But first we're gonna talk about simplicity. As hopefully you're seeing in a lot of this, there's not a lot going on. I mean, and there will be more later on, but when people say, well, how did you get started? It's like, I would take an object and I would put it down on a surface and I'd say, oh, that sounds easy. It's like, yes, it is, you know, wanting to be enabling. But then by the way, it can be more complicated than you think because now you have to think about if it's one thing, your lighting has to be pretty perfect. And then the way you frame it, like where and its composition, and then the color of the object and the color of the background, if you choose to have that. And then what camera settings do you use? What's your depth of field? So I started playing around. And again, these are all experiments in a single object that spoke to me for whatever the reason, maybe because of its color. And then a bunch of found backgrounds that I collect and just playing with them on in the frame to see what happened and you know how things become more dynamic or how things evoke a feeling in you is there an energy to it or is it very serene um i'm also kind of fascinated with things as they dry and as they you know become more brittle uh, i think it's sort of an, an analogy for me of the aging process and so as i get older i'm looking for things that are also aging because there's beauty and and, and a lot of um interesting detail that emerges as things get older. So in this case, you know, just bunches of, I think these are onions. Yes, they're onions, not garlic. In this case, it was Thanksgiving day and I, we were preparing and we had bought a bunch of, of onions. And this one, I guess, had sat out a little bit too long and started to sprout. And it just looked, it looked so, elegant to me, almost like, you know, someone in, in a big puffy outfit. Um, and then the head had, you know, well, I don't know. So it's an alien portrait of sorts. And then I just documenting things now, but the lesson here is how many of you look at your work in black and white? For me, it is part of an everyday practice. And by the way, I kind of I try to shoot for at least an hour a day and I try to process for at least an hour a day. Um, because again, it's sort of like an upper body and a lower body workout and it gets my head in a different spot and I can percolate on other things that I'm working on while I'm shooting. But one of the, one of the really interesting things to me is the transition from color to black and white and, and the power in black and white. And, you know, it's actually become quite a lucrative side of the business because there's a lot of people who seem to like black and white prints in their hotels or their restaurants or their corporate offices or wherever. Um, back to more simplicity, just a bunch of herbs that popped out of one of those little boxes that they sell in the supermarket had such color and, and sort of whimsy to the shapes that I just threw it down on one of the one of my favorite baking dishes. I call this the million dollar baking dish because it's probably earned me that much money over the course of its life. Um, and peppers can be wonderful characters to explore and look at. And you know, again, look at the decision. So a simple baking sheet in the background out of focus, and that's probably a um, a, a, a wooden crate that I asked one of the farmers at the farmer's market if I could buy from him. And he said, well, you don't have to buy it here. And he you know, gave it to me. And in some cases, taking a more exotic thing and just wrapping it up as a color study. But someone came and looked over my shoulder the other day and said, oh, it looks like a baby. And I'd like never thought of it that way, but I guess it's sort of a papoose style wrapping. But something about this just makes me happy. And then there are simple things that you can find everywhere. And there are ways you can practice your layout skills, your composition skills, just by how you frame something. So this huge baker's basket that only had a few croissants, you know, I, I had 180 degree access and I just wanted to see what it would look like in the top corner. And I, then I probably walked around and I shot it in the bottom corner and so on and so forth. Um, more trips to the farmer's market with carrots and or doing more texture studies, looking at, you know, a single object multiplied 
became kind of interesting to me. So farmer's markets are great for that, or bins and supermarkets. I'm the guy who does carry a camera when he goes food shopping and will stop to take pictures because I don't, you know, I'll make the light work. But if I see something, I'm always looking at what the textures and the colors are and, and you know, and it, it's just, it's an all consuming passion. This is sweet potatoes and nuts from Thanksgiving, just shot up close and cranberries in a huge bin at the farmer's market and carrots stacked up, just, and apples in a bin, just very simple garlic. And I think this is purple basil. So color for me, by the way, I don't, I admit this more than I, more than I choose to, but I'm, I'm a little bit colorblind as a guy. And so that doesn't mean I don't see color. It just means that the colors I see are likely different than the colors you're seeing. But I know that the, you know, that the garlic has a purple and red tinge and with a little blue. And I know that the basil is green with hints of purple, but I'm never quite sure if what I am seeing is what you are seeing. Um, so sometimes that makes me angry and I just bang things and crush them and see what happens. And because there's beauty in chaos, so in this case, just literally leaning down on a head of garlic and leaving it and seeing what happens. And then again, looking at it as a compositional exercise and in this case, as a black and white exercise. So this is all, you know, you'll notice I do a lot overhead personally because I think it, it almost feels like I'm looking down at a pad that I maybe used to draw on. Um, and having said that, there were so many angles we can explore. So even though I'm more often than not shooting straight down, I'm also always shooting multiple angles. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but first we're gonna say this out loud together, anthropomorphication. That is when you uh, attribute human characteristics, human traits to an inanimate object. Here's a perfect example. This pepper, is a beautiful person leaning against the wall, almost like flirting, beckoning for you to come over and spend time with, I'm gonna use my pronouns carefully, with it, with them, they. Um, in this case, sometimes you see carrots and you know that they, they need to find the bathroom really quick. Or you can be more active in the discovery process and you can take a few enoki mushroom and throw it under a radicchio leaf on a bed of shallots and cabbage and have a happy couple. And yeah, that's a pepper puppy in the corner. Again, just playing because I want, I want to get all as many ideas out of my brain because they tend to bounce around in there and out because then once they're out, I can let them go. And in this case, I, you know, I'm kind of always trying to see what stories I might be able to create. Uh, as a child, I remember sitting at the, the foot of my grandfather with my cousins and sister and like listening to the stories. And I don't know why I chose to do it with red peppers. And it might've been that I just found this beautiful, larger red pepper that fit into the dollhouse furniture chair that I had bought at a flea market and then saw a bunch of little red peppers and the timing was right. And so here we go. Um, like I said, anthropomorphication. Some peppers have found their bathroom. I don't know if this is appropriate. Um, blueberries do make everything better. I don't know if you've been counting, but I am totally fixated on blueberries in their simplest form. This was from a re recent shoot I did with Nikon, testing their newest macro lens. That was lovely. Um, but there's just something about the hit of blue that balances the warmth of the wood and the other things. And of course you can freeze them. And in this case, I don't know what made me put frozen raspberries and blueberries together with you know, frying peppers, but it just seemed like a fun thing to look at. And more different compositional exercises. You know, I think it's the more repetitive some of these are to me, it, it, it's almost like I'm looking for that idealized shot. And then once I have it, I can let it go forever. But until I've gotten it, I'm gonna keep playing with whatever it is I've come home to. So there's the therapy. It's like the retelling of stories and seeing in the, in the retelling, if you can come up with something new, some different meaning, a different 
way of looking at things. Um, and in many cases, it does lead to commissioned work. I mean, you know, this led to a series for a, a food magazine on ingredients as one page and then final object, final prepared food on the other. In this case, you can guess what I'm making. And um, here it's just patterns and color. And here as well, I, there is just something about sitting and playing with berries and laying out patterns and filling spaces and looking for balance in the right angles and whatever. And even how many plums did I have to cut open before I found the perfect one? And then, you know, playing with that theme. And in this case, I've never seen a pink lemon, but they do exist. Um, and so pink lemons and blueberries, I was making lemonade. Uh, pears for me are my version of salties. I think it's the pandemic eating and stuff, but there's something about a pear that I look at and I smile and I say, ooh, you know, it's, it's me. It's my spirit fruit. And of course, pears fall in love and pears become romantically involved, as I have, and then pears families grow, and then we look at other things. As you've been seeing the aspect of variations um, plays very heavily in my personal work. And so here is a typical shoot. I was at a farmer's market and they were one of my honey guys was selling honeycomb. And I said, oh, give me that because it looked really cool. And then I went home and I said, all right, well, what am I going to do with my honeycomb? Let me get some tea bags and let me start very basically. So this was shot number one. And then let me get some of my fancy dried tea and some dried oranges. And again, I, you know, I have a closet filled with Tupperware containers, hundreds of them filled with all manner of dried spices and fruits and, and, and flowers and what have you. So I can easily go and find what I'm looking for in terms of color and texture. And then, hmm, there's chrysanthemum tea that I had heard about and I bought a container of and I'd never used it. But so this is, these are dried chrysanthemums that they make tea out of. Let's consider adding that to the bigger composition. And then maybe we'll look at, well, do we want a spoon? I don't know. Do we, let's put the tea bags back in. So this is all probably, and I think this was the final shot, but this was maybe an hour's exercise from start to finish with a whole bunch of things that I thought of along the way that it was so easy to explore. And, you know, it just gave me such delight because I could, I, could, I could play with the layout and the color and I could tell different kinds of stories. Now, there's a, we talked about simplicity, now let's go to abundance and I think this is an absolute failure, which is why I'm showing it to you. Um, it, there's nothing good about it. There's something better about this. So what's the difference? I mean, is it, is it the color of the asparagus? Is it the, the pop of yellow in the lemon? Is it the color of the, the you know, or the positioning of the, the yellow and pink mushrooms? What makes one layout different than another? And, you know, it's, it's 10 minutes to pick everything up, organize it, and then plop it down again. So this is something I, I encourage everyone to do. And from that earlier shoot, when I was cutting things up, once you're done stacking, you know, I think I was just looking at the trays I had lined up in my kitchen with all of the different cubes. And I just started putting them together to create sort of a top-down view. Um, and then later, later on, I started cutting up other things because we went from fruits and vegetables and to be, to be truthful, this was probably the next week, but I was still on the square kick. But now I wanted to make sort of an antipast and I wanted to do it in cubist style. So here's a cubic, cubist antipasto. Um, in the fall season, 
when long neck squashes come, I, you know, I'm a fan of finding the most bizarre ones. And so this, this trio like begged to be, to be photographed together. And it just became fun to play around. I think I took, I had like six or seven more in the presentation, but uh, Stacy, who was my sort of photo editor and wife to be, made me take them out. She said, you don't need those. Back to the perfection paralysis. I can't, I'm really bad at deciding what should and should not be. Uh, so a few more here. This is just an exercise in which background works. And I think the white one works because it's a little bit less busy. And, but to be honest, I don't like either of them. Here, there's something beautiful. I always look forward to blood orange season uh, because of the color is, the outside color and the inside color are just brilliant to me. And so it becomes a fun Zen little exercise to peel them and get the, the right shape and size peels. And then in this case, what is the right dish to serve them in? And so it's easy to just lay out a whole pile of different plates, different shapes and sizes, and just plop them down, take a few shots, move on, right? Same lighting, just different plates. And here, again, anthropomorphication meets old, dusty, dinged up serving dish. Is it better simple or is it better in a dish? So these are things I always ask myself. And I, I'm a big butter fan. And so here, more simple spices, but that turned into from this, hmm, let me see how many different butters I can find. So after a few trips to a supermarket, I think I had 10 or 12 different shape and you know different style butters. And so again, I was in stacking mode and I just thought I would make an, a little bit of an elegant still life with butters and bread. Um, I do the same thing with salt. You'll notice spoons because they're easy and they hold things. And you know you can you can keep a lot of them in a small space, and and then it becomes an easy prop to work with. But here, more or less, I don't know. You guys can have your own opinions. Same thing here. Beautiful donut peaches with berries, without berries. Because blueberries make everything better, I'm going to go with this one, but you may like this one because you know what? There's something interesting about the texture of the dish that comes through. But that is the, that is the wonderful thing about shooting for yourself. You don't have any, any worries about who you're making happy except yourself. And so you can come back and you can change your mind. Here's patterns and mandalas, like the act of laying things out and just making patterns with them and seeing, in this case, these are, God, I always forget what they're called, but just the, the rhythm of the, the way they were each opening different from each other became something I got, I got a little fixated on. And they they were, were either gooseberries yeah. or physalis. Gooseberries Thank you. or physalis. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, John. So here just working with, again, recurring themes and just playing with my food and seeing if I want to frame things and how they look when they're framed and you know finding objects that have some relationship to each other and then looking at different shapes and how few things can I get away with. And if I'm working, so this was for a client, but you know, what can I do to accentuate the the shot so it's not just a simple dish but keeping it as simple as humanly possible and here again with a set of concrete plates and here a different client shoot just to just to play with circles so now we have groupings and collections more variations on the theme i'm going to speed up but i like looking at multiples of objects together some related here fall, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving. Here just let's look at things when they're sliced open. This is another variation for me, like cubing things, just slicing them open and letting them, letting them be. And then make sure you all have lots of props. I've been collecting egg beaters for years. I have several hundred. Um, I, and baking dishes, in this case, this is the underside of a baking dish. And sometimes I steal costume jewelry from people I know, people I live with, and put them with, you know, 
smoked fish in old containers just for, for giggles. Um, back to Renaissance influence, you know, here it's a, it's a food crate, a wooden food crate against a piece of wood with a napkin and just some, some of my favorite fruits. This was an exercise in lighting, as was this. I'm not sure which I like better, but again, we're just looking at pairings. And a while ago, someone, Stacy, said, why don't you do something with lint? And I said, why? And she said, well, why not? And so we had to start collecting it. So the act of collecting lint can be a fun exercise with someone you love. And then, well, what are you going to do with it? And by the way, lint is not very colorful. It usually goes to blue and gray. And so if you notice, there's like a little hint of red here and there. I think I might have asked someone to like borrow some red clothing that I just washed discreetly. But then I just wanted lint coming out of everything. And um, these doll piece parts and heads were in Persephone, the tarantula's cage. So you have a sense of my sense of humor. Uh, it gave her someone to like stare into the eyes of and crawl on top of. And it was very Adam's family creepy. But so again, let's the props or what you make of them. And here's a, I believe it's a possum skull if I remember correctly. And ladles of love. I mean, Stacy and I would go to flea markets and, and sort of swap meats, whatever, you know, to kill a little time on a, on a, on a weekend. And we started finding broken and tarnished things that whatever spoke to us. So we developed collections, again, more black and white in color. And just looking at the power of a simple spoon. And for those of you who like Chinese food, and by the way, props don't have to be inanimate, they can be live. So this was from a few weeks ago when I, I was asked to do a series of floral place settings. And so that leads me to kind of different thought starters. I mean, you know, you can go through the alphabet. You can randomly open a cookbook or like Maria did in our, you know, in the last episode, you can create one. You can look at things as they boil or melt or blaze or burn. You can freeze things. You can find prized family recipes and recreate those. You know, find your old cookbooks and have the handwritten ones that have been passed down and then build them. Or then better still, one of the great joys in my life, my grandmother lived to be 102, you know, cooking with her and inviting her into the kitchen so I could document not just her, but the things that she made and that we remembered so well. So here's asparagus and artichokes and beets and berries. And now we go to cauliflower and cinnamon and so on. And here's, you know, the family spatchcock chicken, which, or the, the family turkey recipe or the famous pesto that, you know, I still don't have the secret because the, um, the mother-in-law came and wouldn't show me exactly how she was making it, but presented the plate and or the, the, the sort of marinated tomato salad. Here, frozen food, go into a, you know, a specialty market, pick whatever cuisine you want, but find frozen food, my homage to Irving Penn and stack things up and just see what makes happen. In this case, uh, Stacy said, why don't you talk about what goes through your head a little bit? And so here I bought a bag of Terra Blue potato chips. I love Terra Blue potato chips. And then um, I went and I found a sweet potato and thought that I could put them together in a single shot. So here's the result. In this case, uh, in one of my specialty markets, they had you know packages of ginseng and all manner of matcha powder and dried this and, and all sorts of things. And it felt like I was making, you know, a voodoo potion or a witch's brew. And so she well, so how did you start with this? And it started with the ginseng and I put it down and then I started sprinkling some of the other things. But then I ended up picking everything up because it didn't have enough that was holding it together. And so that's where I just dumped a couple of spoonfuls of, of matcha powder and I think there's some wasabi powder behind it and that that just gave me a pattern that I could work with. Um, similarly with edible flowers I wanted to I wanted to do something that you know I bought a huge amount and I didn't know what to do with them so let me make a salad that didn't have edible flowers as the decoration but added 
added as the main ingredient, where the, the berries in this case are the, the accoutrement. Um, here I was just bored and I decided to raid the pantry and see what was there. And so I pulled out a block of baking chocolate and then I had some really interesting, beautiful cinnamon sticks. And so then I went searching, let me see, do I have star anise? And oh, of course I've got butter and how many sugars do I have? Uh, we have about four different kinds of sugar in the house and some cocoa powder. So this just became, you know, a little still life of baking. And here it was the spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. I think I had a cold when I did this and I had the spoonful of sugar thing going through my head for one reason. And then that became something. Um, this is, how do you know when you go too far? How do you know when you've got enough? And we were talking about that just the other day. And I said, you don't sometimes, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but here's the good news. You can shoot and document each step of the way. And then here's the really interesting part of that is if you do the documentation really diligently, you can put it together as an animated GIF and you can put it up on Instagram and it can become this viral making of, or you can reverse it. And so now you've got two different art forms coming together, but just keep adding until you've gone too far and then undo it. In this case, I just wanted to document the making of um, eggplant, eggplant Parmesan, I think. And, but I didn't have the cheese. So while I was waiting to go get the cheese, I decided to just cut it up and let it sit because, you know, eggplant can be bitter and blah, blah, blah. Here I had gone on a mission uh, to the farmer's market and I saw they had more garlics than I'd ever seen in one sitting. So of course, you know, after I'd been through the one walkthrough, I went back because now I was noticing a pattern. So between the purple garlic and the tiny little garlic in the bottom left corner and and then the slightly bigger garlic. I'd never seen so many varieties, so I had to buy all of it and see what I could make of it. And here's a different variation on that. And this is what I was doing just the other day with the tiny little garlic that I told you was the size of fingernails and dried mushrooms and more Merlot salt and just collections of tomatoes. Here was a different outtake from the, the commission shoot for the housewares company. In this case, I had a pile of chive, flowering chives that I got from a specialty market. And a few of them, you know, they were all very tightly uh, closed except for these three. So I pulled them out and I stood them in the bowl because they sort of looked like they just needed to go explore. And so with that anthropomorphication aspect, you know, I, this came up and it just feels like they're off, you know, alien critters looking around. And these are the stories we tell ourselves when we're, you know, it's late at night or early in the morning and we want to just play and let things happen, which leads me to one of the final notes in this. If you're not smiling, you're doing it wrong, especially if it's personal work. There's no wrong. You are your own best audience. And if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you find yourself frowning, please just walk away and start over when your attitude is a little bit better. So we're going to end with some cookies. And this is where you can find me. And now whatever questions you may have. Well, I can tell you, Alan, that you're absolutely doing it right because I've been smiling your entire presentation. Um, it has been accolade after accolade, inspiration after inspiration. Um, so way, way too many to go through, but I will definitely go over some highlights that we had. Um, one of the biggest questions that we have uh, that seems to be kind of a continuous thing coming by is about your setup. Um, a couple of people asked if you had any images of your BTS. Well, and there we go. <laughs> so Pandemic wear. <laughs> Here's how easy it is. So I do have a studio, but here I am in my home office and I can set things up. I can get a big piece of wood. Mm -hmm. 
and put up a background. And here are all the different lights I was telling you about. So this is a little man light light, soft box, ambient light. And I've got all these other kind of specialty lights that you know that I love. I'm a, I'm a photix and man light guy, big time. They're all continuous LEDs. And it's really just, where's the camera? If I'm shooting from below, I will put the, whatever the surface is on the floor and just look straight down and have at it. So kind of simple. Yeah, that's, that's as, fantastic. As it should be. As it should be. <laughs> you know, when I'm with clients and they need to walk in and sometimes with clients, they want to see abundance. And by abundance, I mean like, you know, is he, is it worth the money? So it's having lots of lights set up on different stands and cards and all these things. But I don't know. I, I kind of like keeping things simple. And, and simple is absolutely beautiful. You know, I, I feel like you channeled Caravaggio into all of those overhead, uh, you know, food portraits. I, I think that's really the only way that I can describe your work as I talk to people. And, you know, the Zen and the workflow, it almost reminds me of, I'm going to butcher the name, but I believe it's John Kwan, the Korean Michelin chef. Yeah. Um, and for those of you that are listening, if you have not watched The Chef's Table and you oh. like Alan's work, I, I highly recommend watching it. Uh, it. It is an unbelievably beautifully well done show. And in one of the sessions is a female um, Buddhist and the Buddhist way of cooking and eating is simplicity. It is about paying respect to the, the food, paying respect to your body. Everything is put out, eaten, and then immediately cleaned and put back. Um, and looking at your work, it just gave me that sense, that almost um, heightened and elevation sense of respect for each of your ingredients. Um, absolutely beautiful, calming. I, I've said this more times than I probably should, but I've started to become a little bit more of a passenger than a driver on these shows. Um, yeah. I, I was unbelievably amazed at the personification that you gave, especially with the peppers. That was so, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's, and it's so easy and it's so much fun. I find myself sometimes like, I don't want to sound like a wackadoodle because I'm not, but you know, it's like as a creative guy, I, I'm sifting through piles of peppers in the supermarket or in a farmer's market. And I find one, it's like, yes, you know, there's grandpa or there's, there's the unruly child. And so like the instant personification of, of an object is so delightful to me. And then just capturing it. And then that becomes a lighting study. So like there's different, there's different segments of the process and each one feels smile inducing and mm -hmm. relaxing and then energizing at the same time. So you go from one to the other and look how easy it is. Like grab a couple of peppers and see what, turn them into people. Yeah, and it, it can be done. I mean, Giorgio O'Keefe is one of the most well-known painters that took a very simple object and created layers and discussions and an entire semester of art school that I went to just focused on her and what the, 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 the meaning of the flower was. Um, we did have a, a technical question. So yeah. Leah asked um, about your editing process. Uh, what are your top five editing moves to create your look? Okay, so um, I do have classes on visual wilderness. I'm not supposed to know if I'm supposed to say that, but I do teach processing because that is a really important part of my work. Um, after I live in the curves panel, I love the curves panel. I love color grading in all of its variations. I mean, I, when I'm working with clients, I'm working in capture mode. When I'm working for myself, I stay in Lightroom. It's just easy and it's quick. And, you know, again, my hour a day morning exercise regimen, uh, you know, everything you saw is Lightroom based. I think 98% of what you saw today. And it's just playing with curves and crushing blacks and, knowing what's possible with the calibration panel at the bottom, which was designed 
for you to compensate for different camera manufacturers, but in the hands of someone who is looking at it as a creative tool, it's, it's a way of adding a level of artistry to your work. So play around with whatever your post-processing tool of choice is and see what happens when you start pushing things a little too far. Um, don't feel like you need to recreate real life because that's easy, right? That, you know, it's kind of a few tweaks out of the camera. How do you, what art do you see for yourself and how do you make that happen? And so for me, right, recreating those Renaissance portraits, that's curves and soft velvety blacks and, you know, vivid but subdued colors. So push the vibrance, but take the saturation down. And, and looking at coloring your shadows with specific curves channels, like, you know, take your, your, the bottom of your blue curve and push it up so you get blue in your shadows, but then pull it down so that the highlights warm up and see what starts happening. Very simple things, very simple techniques, but they allow you to create something that is making you happy and hopefully distinctly yours, because that's what it's all about. And, you know, and that's, a, that's a amazing bit of knowledge. And, and of course, absolutely, Alan, any of the classes that you're running, I would love for you to uh, do a shout out for everyone. People are blown away. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I'm looking at, I think I counted 52 responses of the inspiration and love the work and uh, talented, um, amazing, love, you know, love Alan's work and his philosophy. I love the lighting. It's just positivity and love across the board. So Anything that you would like to share, we are always happy at B&H to help elevate and help push into the artists that, that we work with. Um, we did have one other question, and it's in regards to your personal work versus client-driven work. Are you using a stylist when it comes to client-driven work, or are you styling both sections? Um, it depends. I do. I have an amazing team of stylists that I can call on when I need to. And it really depends on the complexity of the shoot or how many shots I'm doing in a day. Um, and by complexity of the shoot, I mean how many different elements are going on or how many different, you know, how, man, how much juggling can one person do? Mm -hmm. I do love to cook, but I will never ever do a pizza pull. Meaning, you know, how do you get a pizza fresh out of the oven where you pull and the, the mozzarella, you know, and it stretches, There's, there are special techniques that I right. leave to the trained professionals. Right. But for, you know, for easy clients, sure. Or for clients who like to do their own cooking, right? When I work yes. with chefs, some of my best friends are chefs, you know, including Dan Barber, who, you know, at, at Stone Barn, at Blue Hill at Stone Barn, who is on Chef's Table, you know, who just, they will give you a perfect radish with the perfect amount of salt and the perfect type of oil and, and it becomes a three Michelin star bite in your mouth that you've never had anything like it. So when you work with focused people who, who have spent quality time, like there's that Zen, you know, what, what makes this the definitive of what it is? Now our job is just to not get in the way. That's amazing. Um, so we did include Alan's hyperlink to his website. It is alanshapirophotography.com. A uh, ton of information on there and you can reach out to Alan. Uh, the, we got a lot of people asking about it. So if you would just give a shout out to how any of the attendees might be able to find details on your courses, um, okay. I think that would be fantastic. So if you go to visualwilderness.com, um, there is an Alan Shapiro section. You can see, you know, I, some of them are live that are upcoming, but everything is recorded. And so you can see all of the processing courses there. I do think I have a code that I don't, God, I don't know that I can get to it quickly. That would be awful. Hold on. And, and for all of you that are on, uh, you can also email bhshows at bhphoto.com. Wait, and I found it. Oh, fantastic. That was quick. Okay. So let's see, to panelists or to attendees? To, Here we yeah. go. I'm going to put it. Okay. So there, if you copy that code, I believe that is my link for all my classes. If not, just 
Google it and you'll see. Um, I do this a lot um, because I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things I've had this incredible career. I've actually had two incredible careers and hopefully I'll have a third, but I love, I love that I've discovered this thing that is related, but totally different from what I've been doing as a career person that brings me such joy. So it's genuinely a privilege to sort of pay it forward and pass it on and share the passion and the enthusiasm. So, you know. That's fantastic. Well, thank you all for the uh, attendees that stayed with us. It was a very fun and educational course. I love the personification. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce the actual word that you used. No, (laughs) (laughs) Anthropomorphic. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, whimsical delight, um, playfulness, as well as is a very, very serious focus on good lighting. Um, I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon, Alan. Maybe we can find our, our joined friend, Matt Hill, and have ourselves a, a, a nice cocktail and discuss all of the relevant things, To And I um, hear, you know, about rabbits getting tossed around at night at some point. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That'll be a fun conversation to have off camera, Alan. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And please do come back to the chat. We have dropped a couple of links in there for you. Uh, And that concludes day two of the B&H Photo Food Photography Week. Uh, Look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.